Introductory Business Statistics, Chapter 2, Descriptive Statistics. First thing we're going to cover is stem and leaf graphs, stem plots, line graphs, and bar graphs. In this chapter, you're going to study numerical and graphical ways to describe and display your data. This area of statistics is called descriptive statistics. You will learn how to calculate and even more importantly, how to interpret these measurements and graphs. Stem and leaf graphs. One simple graph, the stem and leaf graph, or more commonly known as the stem plot, comes from the field of exploratory data analysis. This is a good choice when your data sets are small. To create the plot, all you have to do is divide each observation of data into a stem and a leaf. The leaf consists of the final significant digit. So what we're seeing here in this STEM plot is a list of, say, exam grades. The lowest grade is 33, and the highest grade that we've recorded is 100. You can see that there are several grades in this STEM plot, and the most common or the highest number of grades that we're seeing are in the 60s and the 90s. And here's how we uh, get to this information. In the STEM, what we're seeing here is uh, if the grade is 33 and there's only one, one person who's had a uh, grade in the 30s, on the left in the stem, you're gonna put a three, okay? Uh, and then in the leaf, if there's somebody who has 33 or 34 or 35, this is where we would put that. It's the final significant digit. In this case, there's only one person who has uh, grade in the 30s, okay? And that's uh, the person who earned uh, 33. In the next row down, you can see that more people have, um, there are three people who have grades in the 40s. There's one person who has 42, another person who has 49, and finally the third person who also scored a 49. If we continue looking down uh, on this stem plot, a couple rows down, you can see that several people, uh, seven people it appears, uh, have grades in the 60s. And then uh, additionally down towards the bottom, there are also seven people who scored in the 90s. So this just gives you a basic overview uh, at a glance of how, what the, you know, where most people scored on their exam for in this example. Uh, you can see that most people scored somewhere in the 60s and somewhere in the 90s. There was one person who uh, had a very, very low score of 33 and one person who had a very high score of 100. Going a little bit further here, we can see that for example, 23 has stem two and leaf three. The number 432 has stem 43 and leaf two. Likewise, the number 5,432 has stem 543 and leaf two. The decimal 9.3 has stem nine and leaf three. Write the stems in a vertical line from smallest to largest. Draw a vertical line to the right of the stems, then write the leaves in increasing order next to the corresponding stem. For example, Susan Dean's spring pre-calculus class scores for the first exam were as followed, smallest to largest. And then we have a range of numbers from 33 to 100, as you can see here on the screen. Now, looking at this stem, uh, the stem plot or stem and leaf graph, you can see that most of the scores fell in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, eight out of the 31 scores are approximately 26%. Uh, percent we're in the 90s or 100, a fairly high number of A's. And again, it's just a, an example to show you how to read the, the stem plot. Here's another example. The data are the distances in kilometers from home to local supermarkets. And if we were going to create a stem plot using the data that follows, uh, what you could see, even by looking at the data here, you can actually see uh, a, a decent concentration of values. You can see that most people uh, appear to have uh, a distance between two kilometers and about uh, five kilometers, as you can see in the stem and leaf plot here. 
stem and leaf graph. Um, the person that has a 12 kilometer distance between their house and the local supermarkets is definitely an outlier. They're, they're only one person. And, and frankly, there's nobody between uh, seven and, and, uh, and 11. So that sometimes you'll see that in a stem plot where you'll see an outlier and you can be like, okay, well, that's weird. That's just one person who, who lives, maybe they live out in the country. They're far away from uh, their local supermarket. Next thing we're going to talk about are line graphs. Another type of graph that is useful for specific data values is a line graph. Here's an example. In a survey, 40 mothers were asked how many times per week a teenager must be reminded to do his or her chores. The results are shown in this table in figure right here. You can see, just looking at the table alone, uh, you can see that the the number of times a teenager is reminded, if they need three reminders, the frequency for that is 14. So that would kind of be the center point of that uh, frequency. And as the parent of a teenager, I would agree. They tend to need uh, several reminders usually, at least a few of them. In the table, you can see the same thing here with this line graph of, uh, uh, of, the, of the line graph here on the left, you can see that there are a high number of people who, again, need to remind their teenager three times to uh, do their chores. <laughs> now, bar graphs, on the other hand, consist of bars that are separated from each other. That's why they call it a bar graph, because it looks like you know, rows of bars. The bars can be rectangles. They can be rectangular boxes. Uh, you can use them basic bars or you can make them fancy. They can even be three-dimensional and they can either be horizontal or vertical. Typically uh, with bars, well, you see them both horizontal and vertical, but vertical seem to be more common. So here's an example of, of our bar graph here. By the end of 2011, Facebook had over 146 million users in the United States. The table shows three age groups, the number of users in each age group, in the proportion of users in each age group. And if we wanted to construct a bar graph using this data, here's how it would look. On the left, you have your table, which shows you your, your categories, basically, of your age groups, your number of Facebook users, and your proportion percentages. If we are making a uh, bar graph, realistically, all we need are our categories which are the age groups, and that's down at the bottom. And then off to your left, we would just use the proportion percentages. That's all we really need at this point um, for the for a basic bar graph. And you can see that on the bottom right of the slide, which shows you that uh, they have 45% of people that are 13 to 25. And then the older you get, the fewer users they have registered. Okay, here's a pie chart that shows you the standard American diet, or SAD, <laughs> and you can see that uh, uh, just like any pie chart, it's going to have a percentage of uh, shown both usually, both visually in terms of the proportion of the pie, the slices of the pie inside of the pie, uh, and also with percentages in this case. Okay, here's a bar chart showing acid load to kidneys and you can see it's very descriptive it shows the level of acid uh, both alkaline and acid on uh, the load to kidneys based on the type of food that you're eating for example okay. here's a bar chart that shows you an increase in after-tax income by income group and you can see this one is actually a Pareto chart where it is um, sorted in ascending order, ascending, where you have on the left the smallest numbers on the on the top or on the right, sorry, the, the highest numbers. Okay. And this chart, same thing. It's just another bar chart. Shows you change in family income. And again, it's also sorted. When you see bar charts, typically we like to see these. Uh, sorted from smallest to largest or largest to smallest in terms of the size of the bar. Okay, And uh, you can see here they actually in this bar chart you have a negative uh, value all the way to the left followed by you know 
a higher value all the way to the top value on the right. And that's what you want to see. Okay, now let's talk about histograms, frequency polygons, and time series graphs. So a histogram, a histogram consists of contiguous or joining boxes. It has both a horizontal axis and a vertical axis. Okay, so up and down, left to right. The horizontal axis is labeled with what the data represents. For instance, distance from your home to school. The vertical axis, or up and down, is labeled either frequency or relative frequency or percent of frequency or probability. You'll see, um, you'll see that those labels are used basically interchangeably. Okay. Um, the graph will have the same shape with either label. The histogram, like the stem plot, can give you the shape of the data, the center, and the spread of the data. So when we're using histograms, a rule of thumb is to only use a histogram when data sets consist of 100 values or more. Again, so a histogram is used for when you have larger data sets. And even 100 values isn't that big, but it's bigger than, say, a stem plot, which is more of a uh, use for smaller data sets. To construct our histogram, first we need to decide how many bars or intervals. These are also called classes, represent the data. Many histograms consist of 5 to 15 bars or classes for clarity. The number of bars needs to be chosen, so you need to set that up. Choose a starting point for the first interval to be less than the smallest data value, so from 0 to whatever your smallest data value is. A convenient starting point is a lower value carried out to one more decimal place than the value with the most decimal places. For example, if the value with the most decimal places is 6.1, and this is the smallest value, a convenient starting point is 6.05. That's 6.1 minus 0 0.05. So we say that 6.05 is more precise or has more precision. Okay? If the value with the most decimal places is 2.23 and the lowest value is 1.5, a convenient starting point is 1.495. Again, we're just removing 0 0.005 in this case, okay? Because we're going back another decimal point or half a decimal point. Um, if the value with the most decimal places is 3.234, okay, because we're going out again here and places after the decimal point, and the lowest value is 1, a convenient starting point is 0 0.995, uh, 9995, rather, three nines and a 5, okay. So that's 1 minus 0 0.0005, and so on and so forth, okay, uh, depending on where the, the most whatever the most decimal places are, just add another zero <laughs> and <laughs> after the decimal point and you, uh, uh, you know, calculate that out. One minus 0 0.0005 or whatever, whatever that happens to be. Uh, typically you won't see, you won't see that many decimal places uh, with basic business, business statistics calculations. Now, if all the data happen to be integers and the smallest value is two, then a convenient starting point is 1.5. Okay, so if these are just integers, we, that makes it real simple, man, real easy. <laughs> also, when the starting point and other boundaries are carried to one additional decimal place, no data value will fall on a boundary. Okay, so here's an example. Following data are the heights and in inches to the nearest half inch of 100 male semi-professional soccer players. The heights are continuous data since height is measured. Again, continuous data, that's how we would treat this. If you remember back to chapter one with different data types. The smallest value is 60. Since the data with the most decimal places has one decimal, for example, 61.5, we want our starting point to have two decimal places since the numbers 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.005, etc. are convenient numbers. Use 0 0.05 and it subtract it from 60, the smallest value for the, for the convenient starting point. So this is your starting point, 59.995.
which is more precise than say 61.5 by one decimal place. Okay, so the starting point then, we're gonna set that to 59.95. Largest value is 74, so we're gonna add 0 0.05 to that. So your ending value of your histogram will be 74.05. More data for a data set. Next, we're gonna calculate the width of each bar or class interval. To calculate this width, all you have to do is subtract the starting point from the ending value and divide it by the number of bars that you desire. Okay? In this case, we're choosing eight bars. So all you need to do is take, in this case, 74.05 minus 59.95 divided by eight. And that will, <coughs> excuse me, uh, give us 1.76. Now, 1.76 uh, for the width is, uh, it's pretty close to two. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna round up to two and we'll make each bar or class interval two units wide, okay? And then there's our data set again. Same data set, I'm just seeing it again. Now, we're gonna round up to two, okay? Uh, what we're doing is we're just making our, our histogram um, easily readable, okay? By using this, uh, <laughs> using the uh, two, the two inch, intervals in this case or okay so anyways we're going to make it two units wide okay and in this case each each uh, unit is a uh, is an inch of height basically so here are our boundaries final boundary or our first boundary our first boundary starts at 59.95 okay our last boundary uh, then they go up by two units or two inches basically until we end at 75.95. And then you can see what the relative frequency is of the different heights of the people on this team. Okay. Now, your text has some uh, examples where they're showing you how to build histograms in uh, with a with a TI-84 calculator. Uh, we typically will not be using any kind of calculators in this class as indicated in, in week one. So uh, you can disregard some of the images showing you how to use uh, the, the TI-84 unless you have one and wanna do this. If not, uh, you should use Excel. And uh, we actually, or, or with JASP, and there are uh, presentations showing you how to to make a histogram uh, available. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna create a histogram for the following data, okay? The number of books bought by 50 part-time college students at ABC College. The number of books is discrete data since books are counted. Um, the next uh, slides are in your presentation, they're in your text, but I'm not going to cover them here because we're not using this. The next thing we have are frequency polygons. So frequency polygons are analogous to line graphs. And just as line graphs make continuous data visually easy to interpret, so too do frequency polygons. So if we want to construct a frequency polygon, first I have to organize my data as if you're graphing a histogram. Then you mark the midpoints of the intervals in the x-axis, okay? Now, plot the midpoint frequency of each interval. Then you connect the points like you do with the line graph. Also, plot the points one interval below to the lowest midpoint with zero frequency, and one interval above the highest midpoint with the zero frequency. Note that these points are included to force the graph to touch the x-axis to give it the closed polygon shape. And here's what it looks like. All right, so, Here's my example. In the top, what I have is a table. Okay? It shows my lower bound, my upper bound, and my frequency, and then finally my cumulative frequency, which we talked about how to calculate that uh, earlier in, in chapter one. In this case, 
what we're looking at is the frequency of our scores. You can see that, that approximately 40 people have somewhere between uh, 84 and uh, about 85 percent. Okay, uh, <clears throat> and that's that's probably the most common. So the range for most of our common scores are between 74 and a half and about 90 percent. And by creating that frequency distribution with our polygon, this is what we can see. Time series graphs. To construct a time series graph, we must look at both pieces of our paired data set. We start with a standard Cartesian coordinate system. The horizontal axis is used to plot the date or time increments, and the vertical axis is used to plot the values of the variable that we're measuring. By doing this, we make each point on the graph correspond to a date and measured quantity. The points on the graph are typically connected by straight lines in order in which they occur. So here's the example. Uh, this is just a, uh, an example looking at the uh, table that's using part of the data set from the World Bank. And the time series graph here, what we can see is that our CO2, and then this is over time, so over from 2003 to 2009, we can see the, the CO2 emissions in the United States. And you can see that there's a trend up and then a trend down. Okay. Uh, that trend down, though, from 2008 to 2009 was primarily because of um, lower economic activity, which means that we're, not, we're not running as many cars and, and producing as many things. We're not, we're not having as much emissions. Uh, that's what... Uh, that's why there's that downturn right there. The important thing is to take a look at the <laughs> at the time series graph and how that looks. Okay. Again, with this, there is also a video uh, showing you how to do this time series graph with Excel with uh, uh, partial data set. Next thing we're going to talk about is measures of the location of the data. So things called percentile and quartiles. To calculate quartiles and percentiles, your data must be ordered from smallest to largest. So that's the first thing. If you have a data set, you need to sort it from largest or from smallest to largest. Quartiles divided ordered data into quarters. Again, that's why they call it a quartile. You have your, your bottom quarter, and then your next quarter, your next quarter, and then your top quarter. Okay. Um, your percentiles divide your ordered data into hundreds. So, for example, if you want to score in the 90th percentile of an exam, that just means that you are, um, you, among the scores that were recorded, it means that 90% of the test scores are the same or less than your score, and 10% of the scores are the same or greater than your score, and that puts you in the 90th percent, okay, uh, because we're dealing with percentiles in, in terms of, of where you rank in, in comparison to the other test scores. So we start looking at uh, percentile and quartiles. You need, again, you need to, to calculate this. The, your data needs to be ordered, smallest to largest. Then your quartiles are divided, order data into quarters. So you have, you know, your 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100%. Your percentiles are divided, order data into hundreds. Okay. And here's the formula that would show you how to find whatever percentile and whatever quartile you're looking for. Now you can use Excel or JASP to find the percentiles and quartiles uh, on your data. And again, there are resources available uh, in your resources to calculate those. All right. Again, this is calculating manually, which we're not doing in this class. Now, here's the important part, is interpreting percentiles, quartiles, and median. So median is the 50th percentile, or it's the, it's the, the second quartile, okay? Uh, a percentile may or may not correspond to a value judgment about whether it is good or bad necessarily. It's just telling you if it is uh, where it sits mathematically. 
it's up to you to make an interpretation. For example, uh, if something is right in the median, it's in the 50th percentile or, or second quartile, uh, let's say it's, a, it's an exam score. Well, it depends on how everybody scored on the exam. A 50th percentile might be good. It might be that, you know, that could be a C, it could be a B, uh, it could be an F, I mean, it could be anything. So that really depends on the context of the situation to which that data applies. In some situations, a low percentile would be considered good. In other contexts, the high percentile might be considered good. Uh, so again, the, the number, doesn't really, the, the value is based on the context of which you are assigning the value of that data. Um, you know, for example, if you have, uh, uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, if, if something was like in, in a high, high percentile of, of positive coronavirus cases, that'd be bad, right? Uh, so, you know, it all depends on what the context is. Here's an example. If we have a math test, the first quartile, and it's a time math test, the first quartile for time it took to finish the exam was 35 minutes. So again, that's the, the first quartile. So the first 25% of people took you know, up to 35 minutes. If we're gonna interpret the first quartile in the context as a situation, 25% of students finished the exam in 35 minutes or less. 75% of students finish the exam in 35 minutes or more. So there's a huge discrepancy or, or, or time difference between, a p potential time difference between people who finished it quickly and people who did not. So a low percentage could be considered good, but that's dependent upon finishing more quickly in a time exam is desirable. Okay. If you're taking, if, if you're not, you'll have some people in a timed exam that if they're done very quickly, it means that maybe they weren't able to answer questions, for example, or they, or on the flip side, they are extremely competent. They work quickly without, uh, without errors. And they just, it was very easy for them to take that exam. Okay. Uh, if somebody takes too long to take an exam, they might not be able to finish. Okay. Uh, so again, it's all contextual in terms of interpreting percentiles, quartiles, and median. It's not the math. It's not the result necessarily. I mean, yes, it's important, but the number doesn't really mean much. You have to put a meaning to that number for it to mean much, for it to mean anything. Here's another example. At a community college, it was found that the 30th percentile of credit unions, credit units that students are enrolled for is seven units. Interpret, so if we're gonna interpret the 30th percentile in the context of this situation, we can say that up to 30% uh, of students are enrolled in seven or fewer credit unions, okay? But 70% of students are enrolled in seven or more credit units. So here, here's the thing though, there's in, in a community college setting, if you're not aware, uh, community colleges serve a wide variety of students. You have students that are going there to to go full time and either get a two year degree or get or transfer to a four year university, or uh, are simply there to take a class of interest, like you know they want to learn how to cook or or, or do uh, welding or something like that. Okay, and a bunch of people in between. <laughs> so there are many reasons for going to community college. So therefore, in this example the value judgment isn't good or bad, it just is what it is. Uh, now, if this were a four-year institution where traditionally people are here uh, full-time, maybe are, are going down to part-time, uh, then maybe that would be uh, bad to have, um, you know, if, if we had like up to 30th percentile, up to 30% of our students were, were part-time, that might be a cause for concern and be something we would need to look into potentially. But at a community college, probably not. It's probably just fine. Box plots. So box plots, also called mox and whisker plots or box whisker plots, but usually we call them box plots because uh, it kind of looks like a box and then little whiskers off to the side. That's, uh, that's uh, why they're called that. <laughs> Anyways. All they do is they give us a graphical image of the concentration of data, okay? So uh, whatever the value is, 
is uh, by the line there. The little box kind of shows you where most of the data is concentrated. Okay. So in this example, uh, most of our data is concentrated between the number two and number nine. Okay. So a box plot is just constructed from five values. You have the minimum value, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, and the maximum value. Sound familiar? <laughs> So we use these values to compare how close other data values are to them. It's just another graphical way to quickly look at uh, where's most of the data at. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me, approximately the middle 50% of the data fall inside the box. The whiskers extend from the ends of the box to the smallest and largest data values. So some box plots when you see them they're very tiny <laughs> with long whiskers and sometimes uh they're a little wider with short whiskers and anywhere in between okay usually you'll see them with longer whiskers though uh, depending on what you're looking at <laughs> anyways they're cute i like box plots <laughs> so the median or second quartile can be between the first and third quartiles or it can be one other or both it just gives you a good quick picture of where most of the data is Okay. So here's the data set. Uh, you can see the data set where it says consider again this data set. The first quartile is 2, the median is 7, and the third quartile is 9. The smallest value is 1, and the largest value is 11.5. And, and the image just shows the, the constructed box plot there. And if where we can see that our median is 7, most of our responses are, uh, uh, most of the data is uh, in the first and second quartile. All right. Now we start looking at, at uh, uh, putting together some calculator instructions, which we don't cover in this course. Uh, again, when we're building box plots, uh, that the instructions for that are available for Excel and JASP. For some sets of data, some of the largest value, smallest value, first quartile, median, and third quartile, they might be the same. So, for instance, you might have a data set in which the median and the third quartile are the same. In this case, the diagram would not have a dotted line inside the box displaying the median. Okay, so if you don't see that, it just means that uh, the median and the third quartiles are the same. The right side of the box would display both the third quartile in the median. So for example, the smallest value in the first quartile were both one, the median and the third quartile were both five, and the largest value was seven. Your box plot would look kind of strange. It would only have one whisker for one, and it would be kind of short and squatty like it is here. <laughs> so not a, not a large range here. In this case, at least 25% of the values are equal to one. 25% of the values are between one and five, and at least 25% of the values are equal to 5. So the top 25% of the values fall between 5 and 7, uh, inclusive. So again, it's a shorter box, uh, and then you're going to have a longer whisker off to the right because your, your last value is 7. Okay. Now we're going to start talking about measuring is the center of the data, measures of the center of the data. Okay, And... Uh, You've probably seen this in, in high school. Uh, if, you, if you took high school math or uh, if you've taken high school statistics, you definitely have seen this. And uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is your mean and your median. And you know, a lot of people get these confused. Mean and median are two different things. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The center of a data set is also a way of describing location. The two most widely used measures of the center of the data are the mean, that's the average, and the median. Okay? To calculate the mean weight of 50 people, I just add the weights of 50 people together, and then I divide by 50. Okay? To find the median weight of 50 people, I need to order the data from smallest to largest, or, or largest to smallest, uh, you know, lightest to heaviest. Um, and find the number that splits the data in two equal parts. Okay, that's the difference. The mean is the average of of everybody, of what you know. How you take 50 people, you you add all their weight together and divide it by 50. Okay, and that gives you the average. Like, what's the average person? Uh, 
what's the average person weigh? If we're looking at the median, again, that's the midpoint. Half the people weigh at that median point or less, and half the people are at that point or higher. Okay. And if when we start looking at what is the most common measure of the center, that is the mean, okay, or the average. The median, however, is generally a better measure of the center when there are extreme values or outliers because it is not affected by the precise numerical values of the outliers. So let's say, for example, we have 50 people and you have, you know, most people are like average weight. Let's say they're around like 180 pounds or something like that. Okay. We've got 50, 50 men that are, you know, five foot, eight inches tall or something. Okay. Now. If we're looking, if everybody's like five foot eight, about 180 pounds, well, then we know our average weight's going to be like around 180 pounds, right? Uh, somewhere around there. Median is different. Let's say you have somebody who is, uh, maybe they are, uh, you know, we're looking at 50 people, but one of them is a very small child, you know, like a baby that's 15 pounds, and then you have, uh, you also have an outlier of somebody who is like a big NFL lineman or something that's like six foot five and about 350 pounds a uh, big giant huge person uh, those are outliers those are going to skew your results significantly potentially uh, if you are looking at the average weight of that group in that case you would use the median because it's it's you have those outliers uh, your your means not going to be precise because it's your one guy that's uh, 300 something pounds and your baby have messed with <laughs> your your overall mean. Uh, so in that case, we would use median uh, would give us more and more of an idea in your median at that point would probably still be closer to that midpoint of, say, 180 pounds or so. We'd have to calculate the numbers to 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 do it. And we don't have that data set here. All right. So we need to talk about the sigma notation. So given a sequence of numbers, we can write the sum of the first however many numbers using a summation notation or sigma. Okay, And uh, uh, the notation derives from the Greek letter uh, sigma, capital sigma, corresponding to S for sum. So it kind of looks like a big E. <laughs> and this is what your sigma looks like uh, down here at the bottom. What you need to do is when you see sigma, it means that you're adding up all the numbers that whatever the sigma is equals first number plus second number, third number, fourth number, so on until you get to the end. In Excel, you just use the sum function. <laughs> all right, so here's the sigma notation. And if you were doing it by hand, that's how you do it. So the left side of this expression is read the sum of it is of a k is from k is one to k is n. The letter k is called the index of summation or the summation variable. And the idea is to replace k in the expression after the sigma by the integers one, two, three, and so on, and add the resulting expressions arriving at the right side of the equation. Okay. So here's how you find each sum. Again, if you are uh, doing this stuff manually, which we are not, <laughs> but you can uh, you can do this if you want to. All right, here's the thing: if we want to find the mean, we have tools available to us where we can literally put in your sample and then use Excel or uh, JASP to find your mean. So I'm not going to go over all the formulas because, again, you in this type of course, we don't necessarily need to sit down and do the formulas by hand. I would much rather show you how to use the tools and interpret the data than to mess with formulas going forward. Another measure of center is called the mode. The mode is our most frequent value. So there can be more than one mode in a data set as long as those values have the same frequency, and that frequency is the highest. Uh, a data set with two modes is called bimodal. Okay, think of bimodal has two modes. 
Okay. So here's an example. Here's a statistics exam course for 20 students, and then it shows you the scores. You can see the lowest score is 50, highest score is 93. Just taking a look at this data set, I can tell that 72, it, yes, 72 is the mode of this uh, this uh, uh, data set and the reason why is because there are one two three four five six there are six scores out of out of 20 students six of them scored a 72 on the exam it's the most common number in here okay followed up by uh 63 80 or i'm sorry 84 and then 63 it looks like and then 59 so again, the most frequent score though is what we're looking for, uh, which occurs five times. Uh, so sorry, five times, and the mode is 72. Okay, here's how you calculate your um, your <clears throat> excuse me your mean of group frequency group frequency tables. And again, we're just looking at how do we find our best estimate of class mean, and those are our grade intervals and the number of students. Okay, let's talk about skewness and the mean, median, and mode. So consider this following data set. Looking at it, you can you can just look at the data set and see that the mode is seven. Uh, so this histogram displays a symmetrical distribution of data. Uh, the distribution is symmetrical. If a vertical line can be drawn at some point in the histogram, such as the shape and the left and right are uh, either mirrored images of each other or, or, or pretty close to it, okay, in terms of, in terms of actually interpreting, uh, you know, the data for looking at this, to, in, for example, like trying to solve some sort of business issue. If it's up and then get and peaks up towards the top and then comes down and slopes uh, down towards the right, or if I can put my finger right through the middle of that, uh, excuse me, that histogram and fold it in half, <laughs> and one half uh, is, uh, one half is, uh, uh, looks very close to the other, then that is called symmetrical distribution of data. In this case, we start at, it looks like we start around four, there's only one of those, and then we kind of go with five, six, five and six, there are more of those, and that's, there are definitely more sevens, that's the most common, that's the mode, that's the one you see there in the center, and then off to the down, as we start going higher in numbers, there are fewer frequencies of those numbers, okay, and so that's, that's a pretty symmetrical uh, data set. All right, so in a perfectly symmetrical distribution, the mean and the median are the same, and this one only has one mode, so it's called unimodal, and the mode is the same as the mean and the median, so it's like perfect, as perfect as you can get. Uh, in a symmetrical distribution that has two modes, or bimodal, the two modes will be different from the mean and the median. Okay. All right. So now let's take a look at this data set. Um, the first one in a symmetrical data set that has two modes bimodal the two modes will be different from the mean and median so compare these sets and their histograms the first one is symmetrical okay the second one is bimodal you can see that there are uh, a significant number of both seven and eight uh, the same amount there uh, looks like there are six sevens and six eights okay and that's just a bimodal distribution. It's still symmetrical though, but it is bimodal because there are two modes. Okay, now if we start looking at skewness and the mean, median, and mode, uh, this is just a histogram for the data, and then they show the data here. It's not symmetrical. The right-hand side seems chopped off compared to the left side. A distribution of this type is called skewed to the left because it's being pulled out to the left. So when you hear it being skewed to the left, that means on the left side, of this distribution, it's shorter, so it's kind of like you're going up a hill, if you would. Okay, if you're starting off at the beginning and you're going to the to the end, you're kind of going uphill. Okay, uh, and on a long uphill trajectory, that would be your. It's just skewed to the left. So this, the mean here is 6.3, the median is 6.5, and the mode is 7. Notice the mean is less than the median, and they're both less than the mode. 
the mean and the median both reflect the skewing, but the mean reflects it more so. Again, the, you're just you have very few people have, uh, or very there, there's only one uh, instance of four, and then you have one five, and then three sixes, four sevens, and an eight. So again, it's it's going to be skewed to the left uh, for sure because you have more frequency of higher numbers off to the right. So here's a histogram that's uh, the exact opposite, pretty much, and it's skewed to the right. Okay, it's also asymmetrical. And uh, what you can see here is that again, seven is your mode, uh, but there are higher frequency of eight uh, in there as well. And there's just one nine and one ten and one six. So again, the mean is 7.7, .7, the median 7.5, and the mode is 7. Of the three statistics, the median's the largest, while the mode is the smallest. And again, your mean is skewing the most. So uh, generally, if the distribution of data is skewed to the left, it means the mean is less than the median, uh, which is often less than the mode. If the distribution is skewed to the right, the mode is often less than the median, which is less than the mean. So basically, they're flipped mirror mirror image almost. Okay. Let's take a look at the measures of the spread of the data. Now we have what are called standard deviation and variance. So your concentration should be on what the deviation tells us about the data. Anytime we look at data uh, within reason, there's going to be a variance and there's going to be uh, a standard deviation. Okay? So here's an example to help us to understand what standard deviation is and tell us and what it tells us about our data set. So here's a list of all of the close friends of Jasmine. The mean of the ages is 41 and a half. Every friend is either older than the average or younger. In other words, the ages deviate from the mean age. The question is, is there a number we can calculate that gives us a measure for the overall deviation from the mean? Absolutely, it's pretty easy to calculate. I'll show you how to do it. So here's the data set, okay? The table below lists the friends with the coded names. A good start is to calculate the deviations from the mean and add them, okay? So here's how you do it. The remedy is to make sure or is to square the deviations or take absolute value of them to make them all positive so we'll square the deviations and add them okay if we look at the previous slide we have some negative numbers all we have to do is square them it gives us positive numbers the problem is solved now what if we divide this number by the total number of close friends then we can call that the variance now I'm going to tell you uh, again in this slideshow that we're not doing this manually, so we will use tools to actually calculate the standard deviation and the variance. And our job is to understand what that means. Okay? The calculation in our case isn't nearly as important as interpreting what it means to have that sort of standard deviation and that sort of variance. Okay. So 8.85 is an overall measure of square ages of Juan's friends called the variance. But square ages doesn't make any sense in the context of the problem. So we need to remedy this. All we need to do is take the square root of this number. The result is called the standard deviation of ages. Okay, so we look at our variance. Our variance is, um, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, uh, 8.85. Okay, let's take the square root of that and uh, ends up being approximately three or 2.97. And that means that uh, our standard deviations is about three years, okay, in difference between their friends. Okay, so when we're looking at our standard deviation and variance, again, a data value that is two standard deviations from the average is just on the borderline from what many statisticians, statisticians uh, would consider to be far from the average, okay? So if we're looking at the average age of uh, Juan or Jasmine's friends, I think we're using that term <laughs> interchangeably here, uh, if they're three years and let's say, you know, Jasmine is, uh, uh, 
No, I didn't. I don't think it said how old Jasmine was. But if it's three years or younger or older than Jasmine, that would be considered kind of average of friends of Jasmine's age. Okay. Once we start getting out of uh, two standard deviations, like six years or so older or younger, you can say that's a much younger friend of Jasmine's or a much older friend of Jasmine's or whatever their age is. Okay. So when we consider data to be far from the mean, it is more than two standard deviations away is more of an approximate rule of thumb than a rigid rule. Again, everything in statistics, for the most part, <laughs> is contextual, okay, when we're interpreting data. Um, for example, if Jasmine's friend is much older or much younger, is that an issue? I don't know. It's, I guess, if anything, it's just interesting to know. So in general, the shape of the distribution of the data affects how much of the data is further away than two standard deviations. So for example, if Jasmine has a friend that's 10 and a friend that's 80, the standard deviations are going to be bigger than if most of her friends are in their, in their um, 30s, late 30s to late 40s, for example, okay? When we start, if the numbers come from a census of the entire population and not a sample, uh, when we calculate the average of the square deviations to find the variance, we divide by n, the number of items in the population. If the data are from a sample rather than the population, when we calculate the average of the square deviations, we divide by n minus 1, one less than the number of the items in the sample. Most of the time when you are talking about uh, real studies, Usually we have a sample, so we do n minus 1 instead of just n, okay? In the case of Jasmine and her friends, or Juan and his friends, uh, we're doing n because that's the number of, we have, that is the population. That, those are Juan's friends, okay? So it depends on the, how, what you're studying. Now, you will most likely, uh, if you're studying the the, you're usually going to be studying a sample, so in general, you're going to do n minus one here. Okay, not n. Usually, unless it's a, unless it's you have the entire population that you wish to study. Okay, for the sample variance, we divide by the sample size minus one. So why don't we divide by n? Now the answer has to do with what we call population variance. So the sample, it's just an estimate of the population variance. And all that, and it, it's almost like, okay, you have several trains of thought in, in mathematical modeling, okay? Uh, some, some people are like, okay, well, you know, if, it's the, if the sample is indicative of the population, why don't we just do N? Keep it simple. And then you have another train of thought of saying, no, 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 that because we need some way to separate them. And then another train of thought of, well, uh, we can't have it the same as the population because it's just a sample. So anyways, I don't know how all this stuff got completely uh, settled out. But just remember, when you're working on a sample, n minus 1, if you have the whole population, n. And the n minus 1, again, is just so you have an approximation the sample should should be what an approximation of the overall population is you're just you know trying to get close again it's statistics <laughs> it's not going to be absolutely super precise all the time and this is an example of it <laughs> politics and mathematics so if jasmine had thousands of social media friends and the list of ages were a sample of her friends then we would have to slightly modify our calculation again uh, of the variance in the standard deviation, n minus 1. Okay. But in her case, uh, we just did n because we have a list of her friends and their ages. More slides on how to calculate your variance with the TI-84. You could ignore these. All right, if we're looking for standard deviation of group frequency tables, so for group data, again, we do not know individual data values, so we can't find the exact mean or uh, median or mode, but we can, we can do an estimate basically of the measures of center by finding the mean of the group data with this formula that's right here. Again, you can use, uh, you can find 
the uh, mean of group data uh, with both Excel and JAS pretty easily. So I'm not going to go over this formula. Um, so while the formula for calculating standard deviation is not complicated, the calculations are tedious and it's best to use software. <laughs> All right, if we want to compare values from different data sets, we can do that too. Uh, the standard deviation is useful when comparing data values that come from different data sets. If the data sets have different means and standard deviations, we can actually compare those uh, you know, with, with each other. Now, if we compare them directly, that can be misleading. Uh, if, if different data sets, it, it could be from different survey, it could be different questions, a whole different population. I mean, there's all kinds of pop, different sample uh, size is all kinds of stuff that could be kind of misleading. In such cases, though, we, what we do is we calculate the z-score for each value. So for each data value, we can calculate how many standard deviations away from its mean the value is. We can find the distance between the value and the mean, then divide by the standard deviation to find how many standard deviations fit in the distance. Uh, you can use these formulas right here uh, to, to find the values from population or sample. Okay. And this will give you your z-score. It's pretty cool. Okay, so if I want to compare values from two different data sets, I have two different students, John and Allie, and they're from different high schools. They wanted to find out who had the highest GPA when compared to a school. They're not at the same school. So that tells you right now there's there are two different data sets uh, because uh, things are different. There, there, there are all sorts of, um, uh, you know, the, the academic performance at one school is going to be different, certainly different from the academic performance at another school. Now, uh, how much different? It depends on what this, if you look at the, whatever the mean is and the standard deviation. For example, uh, let's say they use different GPAs. John's is a very traditional GPA. It's probably a uh, you know, from a zero to, to four and, uh, his mean GPA was a three. So he had like a B average, right? And his standard deviation is, is 0.7. Um, so with, uh, with Ali though, or Ali, uh, their GPA is 77 high school, school mean GPA is 80 and standard deviation is 10. Well, what does that mean? Okay. Uh, not much. You just have to do some basic calculations to figure out how they, how they match up. So here's what we do. Okay. Um, all we have to do is this. If we're looking at these values of population, if he, if, if uh, uh, John, if we want to get that z-score, it's 2.85 minus 3 divided by 0.7. Okay. 2.85 so that's his GPA minus the school mean GPA divided by the school standard deviation. You can see his is negative 0.2. And Ali or Ali um, is uh, 77 minus 80 divided by 10. Okay, so that ends up being point, uh, uh, negative 0.3. So John has the better GPA when compared to his school. Uh, because his GPA is 0.21 standard deviations below his school's mean, while Allie's GPA is 0.3 standard deviation below his uh, school's mean. Okay, the smaller the number, or the larger the number there, sorry, uh, the better in that case. They both are, you know, are, are not too far off the mark of what the mean is for their uh, school GPA. Okay, so average students. Okay.